let's get started and thanks for bearing with me. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about the intersection of security and design and ways to help users make better choices and make better decisions in terms of staying safe online. So I'm Jade Applegate and I'm a user experience engineer. This is my first time to Raleigh and I live in the San Francisco Bay Area for the last four years. If you have questions for me during or after the presentation, you can always tweet at me at Jade Applegate. I work for a company called Fastly, where I am an engineer on the UX team. And Fastly is a real-time content delivery network where we serve dynamic and static content for companies like Pinterest, Imager, GitHub, and many others. So we are involved in and we support several open source projects. And my team specifically is planning to release two more in the beginning of 2016. So it's pretty exciting for us. Um, in terms of as a place to work, it's great. We have four offices in, all around the country and all around the world. We have one in San Francisco, New York, London, and Tokyo. And please come find me if you'd like to learn more. So with that out of the way, my little spiel, so they'll let me come here. <laughs> Let's get started. So user experience generally focuses on reducing friction for users that are on the happy path. So typically these things are viewed as a conversion or acquisition funnel, and we're all pretty familiar with this type of cycle. As an example, if you have a shopping website, you would want a customer to create an account, put something into their cart, complete that checkout process, and even perhaps return again in the future to make another purchase. Your site would be optimized for this flow, for the shopping flow, because that's how your business works and that's how you make money. And what I'd like to talk today instead is putting the emphasis on designing and planning the user experience for destructive actions on your site, like deleting an item from your shopping cart, or canceling an order, or deleting someone's entire account. Typically, these so-called destructive actions and warnings are less thought through because they don't contribute to that happy path of customer acquisition or revenue. But in some cases, they're just as important for the user experience, especially when the topic of security is involved. So today, let's skip the happy path and talk about the opposite, which is adding friction to the user experience. And we'll talk about where that makes sense to do so and I'll introduce you to some relevant security-related research, as well as some UX guidelines worth paying attention to. So user experience should typically be frictionless until it isn't. So what does that really mean? Uh, here are a few examples that I'll go through of best practices when it comes to designing destructive actions in your application. This is where designers took time and empathized with users and made it easier for them to navigate this type of transition. They purposely put in some sort of roadblock, roadblock to confirm and bring awareness to the action they're about to make, even though it's not part of the happy path that we talked about. So these are all what I like to refer to as the, are you sure because there's no turning back after this action? So let's take a look. This first example is from Google's design specs, and it's regarding the language that you use when you're discarding a draft. And as you can see, it's important that you not use yes or no, because those are pretty ambiguous. And you should instead use some sort of explicit language to help the user focus on the outcome of what will happen after they make this decision. So this helps eliminate any confusion, and it makes it easier for the user to understand what, will, what exactly will happen next. This second example comes from the Fastly app that I'm currently working on that's in private beta, where we are redesigning our website. So we pop up a modal confirmation with a delete action and the name of the, the item you're about to delete. And sometimes it makes sense to double check with your users before they complete that sort of deleting or destructive action. And you'll want to note here that the button says confirm and delete rather than yes and cancel instead of no, based on what we learned in the previous slide about being specific. So this third example is from GitHub. It's one of my favorites. It's when you're in the danger zone. So it's important to alert users when they're in a place that 
their changes will have some real consequences, and sometimes these consequences you can't go back from. Since the stakes here are so high, like when you're deleting a repository, for example, you even have to type in the name of the repository in order to proceed with the delete. And this makes the user actively engage in the experience and has less of a margin for error since there's so much involved in that process. So these are a few examples of adding friction uh, to the user experience. And I know they're small, but I wanted to point them out as good design and good implementation in order to help users make better choices online. A lot of the times, users can be on autopilot. I'm sure we can all feel what that's like. And um, it's especially useful to do this when someone's on a site they use frequently because they're so familiar with what they're doing. So they can be distracted and not realize the repercussions of just clicking a button, for example. So that's why even though these are not the happy path actions that we talked about, it's important to purposely add friction to your application so you can snap someone out of it before they do something they didn't intend to. So by putting yourself in their shoes and understanding what they'll go through, you can empathize and design and implement a better flow. So let's take a bit of a deeper dive into a few case studies where uh, they share some of the same principles. So one thing that really intrigues me within the world of user experience design is that seemingly small improvements can have a big payoff. And there are two really fantastic studies done by researchers uh, at Google that I'd like to share with you today. And these both focus on improving browser warnings using user experience and design principles. Let me grab a water. So as we know, browsers show an authentication warning or an SSL warning when the user's information is at risk. So this browser warning is an example of the importance of adding friction to the user experience. So this first study, which was entitled Experimenting at Scale with Google Chrome's SSL Warning, it was published last year, and it focused on figuring out why user behavior differed dramatically between Chrome and Firefox browsers when an SSL warning was shown. So first, this study is focused on the metric of a click-through rate. So let's define that just so we're all on the same page. When the SSL warning appears, users have two options. One is to abandon their destination website and return to safety, or two, to consider the warning and then dismiss it and proceed to their intended destination. So the percentage of times that a user selects that second option and proceeds despite the warning determines the click-through rate. So typically a high click-through rate is a good thing um, if you're working on any other type of site, but when it's uh, in the case of ignoring the SSL warning, it's not a good thing. Um, you may also be familiar with the term adherence. In this case, adherence to the warning is 100% minus the click-through rate, if you want to think about it like that. So prior research showed that the Mozilla Firefox SSL warning had a much lower click-through rate than Chrome. In fact, in Firefox, the click-through rate was 33%, whereas in Chrome, it was 70, so pretty significant. And the difference here, um, because it was so significant, they wanted to know why and how to improve their click-through rate in order to keep users safer online. So the authors stated that their goal was to decrease the number of users who ignore the warnings in Chrome. And unfortunately, users struggle to really understand and often disregard these types of warnings. In this study, they investigated several factors that could be responsible in that difference in click-through rate. And we'll explore two of those today. One is the use of imagery, and two are style choices, both seemingly small things. So just to test these factors, they ran six different SSL warnings in production, and they were used in Google Chrome 29 and seen by about 130,000 people. And these warnings were designed to test several hypotheses that the researchers had about how users might respond to different manipulations in the design. As I mentioned, the first factor that was tested was the use of images, and their hypothesis was that since the brain's social response to human images is instinctive, that by including the images, that should suggest the feeling that they're being watched and thus click, reduce the click-through rate. 
However, that didn't actually end up being the case at all. It didn't have any change in the click-through rate, even though they included these human faces, like the policeman and the criminal, and the red traffic light to indicate stop. There was no difference in the click-through rate. So let's look at the other factor, which might be responsible, which were the styling choices. So in addition to testing slides with the images that we just saw, the researchers also used three different styles. So this first style tested was the existing Google Chrome warning. This is what users would see. And it says, this is probably not the site you're looking for. You should not proceed. And that has two options that are equally weighted, proceed anyways or back to safety. This is the second style they tested, and it was a mock of the Firefox warning. They took what was in Firefox, and they copied it over, and it says, this connection is untrusted. What should I do? I understand the risks, get, or get me out of here. And the third style tested was the content of the Firefox warning plus Google Chrome styling. And so it says, this connection is untrusted. What should I do? Get me out of here. It has a little bit more of the Google uh, look and feel. And they thought that by applying corporate style guidelines to a warning, since warnings typically resemble corporate products, don't stand out as unusual, that blue button doesn't seem unusual, that it would actually increase the click-through rate and they might see something above 70%. But what they saw was that no changes to the styling had any difference at all. So styling doesn't work and images didn't work. So we've ruled those both out. So they're still looking at what makes this SSL warning so much more effective in Firefox than Chrome. And remember, it was 33% versus 70. So they thought and they looked at Firefox warning, and they noticed the warning's text and the layout and the default button choices were different. So maybe they're responsible. And they noticed that the warning in Firefox avoided technical language. It identified specific ways to mitigate the security risk, and it hid the technical de details by default, giving only one default choice as an option. So to be able to get all of these elements right is pretty complicated from a user experience design standpoint. Um, and the team was in intrigued, so they explored this in a subsequent study. And this is where it gets fun as things start to happen. Um, so the follow-up study was called Improving SSL Warnings, Comprehension and Adherence, and it was published earlier this year. And it focused on the warnings in Chrome, and they thought that they would just have a goal of improving comprehension. Maybe people aren't understanding the warnings that they're seeing. And they thought that by improving comprehension, the click-through rate would be lower, and they might get closer to matching that of Firefox. So their first goal was to help users understand the situation that they're in when they see this warning. And if that wasn't possible, to at least help guide them to safety and um, get them out of there. So this was tested in Chrome 36. And it was tested in a lab setting through different interviews. And it involved about 7,500 responses. So the three topics that they looked at that we'll touch on are comprehension, language, and the topic of opinionated design, which I think you will really like. So the main goal of this study was to increase comprehension. And to achieve that goal, the ideal warning would convey these three things. It would convey the source of the threat and let an informed user know that they would not need to evaluate how benign or malicious the destination website was but they should instead realize that there's a, may be an attacker at some point between the user's computer and the website server. So they wanted to convey that succinctly. The second thing was which information was at risk. An informed user would consider the sensitivity of the data that they had ever entered on that website and not just the information that they might enter if they proceeded. And thirdly, the potential for false positives. So when weighing the likelihood of a false positive, the user would consider the website's reputation and whether or not they've gone to this website before and it works normally. So now that we know what was needed to be understood, let's talk about how they might go about understanding this. So in general, technical jargon, 
you want to avoid it because uh, when you're designing a good user experience, it's pretty ineffective to include that very technical jargon given your audience. So people are more likely to read beyond the first sentence of a warning if it uses simple language. And advertisements and warnings that have really technical language in them usually hold less interest and are less likely to be remembered or even obeyed. So as a non-tech example, if you were preparing to paint a room in your house, uh, people were more likely to follow the simple instruction to open a window than to use the paint in a well-ventilated area. So just think about that for a second. And since Firefox has less technical terms in their warning, and Chrome uses many technical terms like server, operating system, security certificate, and trusted authority, this can get very confusing. So for these reasons, the researchers decided that the language that they develop in the warning should follow three guidelines. They wanted it to be brief, uh, large quantities of text that look like they will take a lot of effort to read. Generally, people read none of it. <laughs> so a complication here is that they needed to explain this really complicated threat in a succinct manner. But they figured that given the choice, They'd rather the user read some of the text rather than none. The second thing is um, using an appropriate reading level. So ideally, language for a general audience needs to be at a sixth grade reading level so that everyone can understand it. So by avoiding the technical jargon, they need to be at the sixth grade reading level. And the third thing that they needed to convey was the specific risks of their data. So Previous research has shown that people are more likely to comprehend with and comply with a warning if it describes specifically the risks that might happen. So when possible, it's best to describe all the data types that might be at risk, like your password or your credit card information or the messages that you send, rather than just saying your information might be at risk, which makes sense. So based on these comprehension and language guidelines, this is the proposed warning on the left compared with the warning that they were currently using. And I'd like to read these to you. So their proposed language says, your connection is not private. Attackers might be trying to steal your information from facebook.com. For example, passwords, messages, or credit cards, and has the option to ignore the error. And what they're currently using says, your site, this site's security certificate is not trusted. You attempted to reach facebook.com, but the server presented a certificate issued by an entity that is not trusted by your computer's operating system. This may mean that the server has generated its own security credentials, okay, uh, which your browser cannot rely on for, for identity information or an attacker might be trying to intercept your communications. You should not proceed, especially if you've never seen this warning before, and it gives you the option to ignore. So which would be easier for someone to act on? Obviously, the one that they spent all the research on. So by applying the three language-related terms of brevity, reading level, and describing the specific data risk, it actually boils down to a pretty succinct one-sentence message. So now that the researchers had decided on what information the warning should contain, the next step was to determine how that information should look. And here they introduced the concept of opinionated design, which I love. And it's the use of visual cues to promote a recommended course of action. Because simply providing information without clear instructions doesn't necessarily influence behavior. For example, uh, you don't always choose a healthier food to eat because you've read the nutrition labels. So there are two important concepts of opinionated design that I'd like to emphasize, and I'll introduce you to both. Uh, one is the concept of choice attractiveness. The researchers wanted the safe choice to be more visually attractive. They used that familiar bright blue uh, primary action coloring so that the users would associate that button as a default action. So it's this button here that says back to safety and not no or cancel as we talked about before. And the other important concept is choice visibility. 
So it's where the unsafe choice to proceed, or the unsafe choice to proceed, given how technical you are, uh, it's hidden behind this advanced link. And when you click on that link, uh, you can see this extra information here. And there's a link that says, OK, proceed to this website, and it says unsafe next to it. But it does give you the option. And by having this hidden choice require some effort to get to, the researchers believe that in doing so, they would view it as not recommended. Also, the fact that it says unsafe next to it. But there are a few downsides here. One is that there's an increased amount of effort to ignore a false positive. If you're going to your banking website and you're used to seeing this information, you have to go through and click that every time in order to proceed. And the second downside is that users may not even realize there's another choice other than back to safety if they don't explore that advanced configuration. So let's look at this final SSL warning that they designed. And as a result of optimizing for language comprehension and applying the new styling that we talked about and using the opinionated design principles, this is the proposed design that was released as the new Google SSL warning in Chrome 37. And with this new design, the click-through rate went from 70% to 42%, bringing it pretty, pretty close to the Firefox rate of 33%. So this, what this really meant was that there were millions of additional users per month that were choosing to act safely due to this warning design change. And these changes might seem small when you parcel them out, but they had a huge impact in terms of user security. So what is the purpose of all of this and why should it matter to you? Uh, first, you might not think to optimize something like this by default, because so much of the time we're focused on the happy path. But as we've seen, making these small changes uh, to something like a browser warning can have a huge security impact in the millions of millions of users. But looking back to the examples we looked at at the beginning of the talk, you don't even need an entire research team to, or to have millions of users to verify your results. These techniques are applicable to you even in a, on a smaller scale. And even the most basic JavaScript alert that says, are you sure before you cancel or delete something is better than adding no friction at all to your user experience. So secondly, this matters, or this might matter to you or your team or your company because applying this type of friction to UX, um, where it makes sense to do so, has a lot of upsides. Uh, it results in less support requests because uh, you've optimized certain edge cases you hadn't thought about before, and it reduces user errors. It also provides a better user experience regardless of whether or not that user is contributing to your conversion funnel or your bottom line. And finally, it gives the user control over specific actions and, and it enables and empowers them. Think back to the danger zone from the GitHub example. I mean, how badass do you feel when you're in the danger zone and you have that control? If you've optimized for comprehension when you're designing these things, you're more comfortable giving the user control because you're confident in their understanding of what's happening. I mean, imagine emailing GitHub every time you wanted to delete a repository. That wouldn't make any sense. And by doing that and giving some control to your users, it can take some manual work off of your team. And these changes can be done in a confident way by a user rather than having to rely on an internal or ad hoc process every time something needs to happen that's a little too scary to give away. So I hope that you'll find some of these topics interesting and you might use some friction in your next project. Um, where it makes sense, and thank you for being such a great audience. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have, um, if there are any. You can also find me after this or online at Jade Applegate. I've put my slides and other resources, including the two research papers we went over, um, up online on my GitHub account, so you can have fun reading those on your own. Thank you. Question time. I saw a lot of you taking notes, so I'm happy to take any questions now if there are any. Uh, what's your opinion on when users take a destructive action, delete the file or something, uh, providing a less legal option rather than uh, putting a case before uh, taking an action? 
Well, one thing I love like in Gmail is that when you hit send on an email, you, can, you have 30 seconds to undo. And as like a nervous person, <laughs> I'm always like, oh, maybe I want to undo it. I mean, that option is nice, but that also delays your message by 30 seconds. So you may want to kind of like weigh those um, options. Um, it depends on like how you're deleting things from your database maybe. You know, if it's gone, it's gone. Um, sometimes it just gets hidden, so things like that. Um, it's going to have to weigh the consequences of holding on to that information and how long you would want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Sure. And I'll get you. Hi. Uh, why, why couldn't the, the new message in Chrome match the, the numbers of the Firefox? Oh, why was it 42% and 33? Yeah. Um, be happy with what you get. <laughs> um, it's no, it's I think. It was on purpose made to, 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 to get a better click through rate, right? A yeah, they really rate. wanted to match that 33%, oh, right. and, and they couldn't. Um, and so it really just warrants more research. It's none of the, the things that they explored. I mean, if you remember that first study, it had no impact at all on what they did. So they said that that 9% or so must be related to other factors. Um, but if you want to have a really great time, I would recommend reading the 17-page paper. And they really get into like all the reasons why or things they might test in the future and future studies. But they were just so happy with 70 to 42 that it was so significant of a change. Absolutely. Uh, he said that the user base, did they consider that it might be different? And that absolutely could be the case. They could have less technical people using um, one browser versus the other. I mean, there are Chromebooks that are really easy to get, and they're cheap. And you know, my parents have one. And I don't think they really even know how to use a computer that well. So you, know, you might want to like, consider your user base in terms of uh, what you're investigating. That's a really great point. I think that's a very interesting point, but also you think like up through Chrome 38, I forget what number. Yep. Right? Their users developed the habit mm -hmm. of looking through when they got to that yep. site, when they went to particular sites, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, now the page looks different, but I'm motivated to keep clicking through yep. like whatever it takes. Yep. And if you'll remember, like the difference in the message was so significant. They probably just ignored that forever, that big, long paragraph about certificate authority that doesn't really even make sense unless you're like, really well-versed in that. Um, so they probably have become accustomed to just ignoring. So there might be a section of their user base that still kept going through despite the changes. That's also a great point. I mean, that's why it's important to always have a good certificate on your site. Absolutely. You're training users to do the wrong thing. Yes. By telling them you have to go through that. Yeah, people are really get accustomed to the flow that they're working with. So sometimes, um, even if the design is better, they will prefer the old design because at least they knew how to use that. Did you have a question? Just stretching? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, they were published in a journal. I can't remember which one, but um, they are linked on the GitHub to PDFs um, of those, so you can read them for free. Um, I think it was like ACM or some journal I can't remember. Um, I had a hard time actually tracking them down when they weren't just like the abstract behind a firewall, actually. So the PDFs are there, so you don't have to hunt them down. but. Um, I know that they were published in a couple of places, and then they gave talks about them. Yes, absolutely. They would have put them on their own website as well. Um, OK, thank you guys so much. That was really wonderful. And um, thanks for all the great questions.